I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I just pray that you'd uh, guide my thoughts and help us to glorify you what we do, Lord. We know I pray. Amen. All right, so let's get started here. I'll go through these proofs with you right quickly. Um, <clears throat> we should still have time for questions afterwards. Um, so this was one of the theorems that I skipped. Uh, if you have a finite group and you pick any element in it, it has finite order. Proof of this is so simple. All you do, you pick your, pick your element of the group, look at the set g, g squared, and so forth and so on, right? By closure of the group multiplication, that has to be a subset of g. Subsets of finite, sub, fi, subsets of finite sets are finite, right? So it's finite, which means that it has to eventually repeat. You're like, haven't you showed us this argument before? Like, yes, this comes up in like four separate things, the same stupid argument. Um, but it's not a stupid argument, it's actually an important argument. <laughs> um, anyway, so g to the k equals g to the m, which means that g to the k minus m is equal to 1. By the theorem I actually did prove in class, that proves that that's a multiple of n, right? So if that's a multiple of n, of course, um, that is to say that um, k minus n, k minus m is finite, right? If it's a multiple of a finite number, it's finite. Consequently, g has order at most k minus m, which proves it's finite. That's theorem number one. Um, the other theorem that I, I don't know if I even stated this one, but this is an important thing to know. If we have, um, <clears throat> and I, I just put a sub t here, it's not especially important. I'm just saying the universe in which this permutation lives is permutations of, of the first t numbers, whatever. Um, if it's got a disjoint cycle factorization, gamma 1, gamma 2, da da da, da gamma r, um, then the order of sigma is equal to the least common multiple of the orders of its disjoint cycles. All right. Now, notation, you notice that Nicholson starts using, I don't know if he ever defined it. Maybe I didn't read carefully enough, but you know, at some point we start using what? Whoa, this for order. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because the order, I mean, that's based on, that, that notation is, is, is reasonable because the, if you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by the jth cycle, right, the order of that is, well, I mean, the order of that is the order, little o, sorry, little o of gamma j, right? So it, it kind of makes sense to introduce the symbol that that's just this, just for the sake of not, write, lit, not writing little o's all over the place, all right? The downside of it is, of course, if you're working on another problem that has like modulus or absolute value, eh, not so great. But we only got so many symbols, unless we're going to start learning Chinese or something, right? Okay, so let n be the least common multiple of n1 through nr, where those are the, the, the orders of each of the disjoint cycles, right? In other words, that's length n1, that's length n2, that's length nr, right? Um, that means that n is a common multiple, right? So it's going to be like L1 times N1, L2 times N2. There's different multipliers, right? Everybody with me? Does that make sense? Least common multiple. So if you calculate the nth power of sigma, then because disjoint cycles commute, we have the nice law of exponents that this to the n is the first thing to the n, the second thing to the n, so forth and so on. If they don't commute, you can't do this, all right? But if they do commute, we can. And then, of course, each one of these n's, I can, I can, I can, sort, I can uh, put in L1, N1, I put in L2, N2, and then I put the N1 inside and the N2 inside and so forth because that allows me to use the fact that the order of gamma 1 is N1, right? Which means that gamma 1 to the N1 is epsilon, right? And so if you want me to be a little bit more fussy, there. <laughs> okay. But the identity to any power is the identity again. So there you have it. Now that does not prove that the order of sigma is the least common multiple, right? What's that prove? That proves that the order is at most the least common multiple, right? It's in principle possible that we could have order less than n. We need to rule that out. Otherwise the proof isn't complete. So various arguments exist. Um, I kind of ignored Nicholson here and just thought of this myself a few minutes ago. Could be wrong. Hey. 
probably not. I, hopefully, hopefully not. Suppose, suppose we have sigma j is, is not equal to the per identity permutation for some j less than n, okay? Um, we, we'd like to show that that's impossible, right? If we can show that's impossible, that forces the order of sigma to be actually n, right? Um, so epsilon would be sigma to the j, which is again this. Um, multiply both sides by sigma 1 to the j inverse, like that. And then what I wanted to do was to get it down to just gammas to make it kind of more intuitive what the argument was. So if I, if I just multiply this side by gamma to the gamma 1 to the j minus 1, then I can multiply the other side by this to the... Um, I'm trying to think if I can... Uh, maybe I have a sum I'm trying to prove there. Curses. Now that I look at this, I'm not convinced of that step. Let me go back up here. I think I can actually, I, I actually think I don't need that step anyway. I think I can get it from here. Let me get rid of this. Okay. You guys tell me why this is a contradiction. Why does that contradict the given data? What's the given data? These are what? Disjoint, right? So take some element in n sub t, right? Which is, and this is not, these are not, we're not, we're, the gamma 1 through gamma r, they're not the identity permutations either, right? That would be a special case. We can make a separate argument for that. So, so I mean, there's got to be something that's moved by these. But the point is, anything that's moved by these, right, is also moved by this. I mean, they're disjoint, right? So if it's moved by gamma r, it can't be moved by the rest of them, for example. And yet, if it's moved by gamma r and not moved by the rest of them, it must also be moved by gamma 1 to the minus j power, right? And, and any, per, any power of a permutation moves the same set as the permutation itself, right? You could prove this. This would not be hard to prove. Um, like, this is an identity. This would make a good test question. The set moved by sigma is equal to the set moved by sigma to the k for k in the integer. I mean, this is a, a lemma you could prove. So given this lemma, all right, this is clearly a contradiction to disjointness, right? It contradicts that they're disjoint cycles. Consequently, no such j exists, and that proves that the order must be the least common multiple. Okay. This would have been less fun to prove without these ideas of orders of elements, right? I mean, you would still have a shot at it, just, just doing just, you know, hand-to-hand -hand permutation cycle calculation. Like, you could probably still convince yourself this is true, but this is so much easier. This theorem I stated in class but didn't prove yet, but we should go over the proof. It's elementary and it's worth looking at. If we have the order of g is n for some g and g, and if d is a, a positive divisor of n, um, then the order of g uh, to the d is n over d. So let's assume, you know, order of g is n, and, and that means, of course, that g to the j is not equal to 1 for that. Although I didn't find that I actually needed that for this proof, whatever. Um, so I'm going to assume that d is greater than 1. Assume d divides n. Um, that means that n is equal to kd for some, for some k, right? And we can assume that k is positive here. n, kd, all positive. Um, so we can calculate. gd to the k is g to the dk, but dk is n. g to the n is by assumption 1. So the order of g to the power d is at most k, which is exactly n over d. Again, this does not prove that the order is n over d. This proves that the order is at most n over d. It's still up to us to show that it can't be less than that. So let's look at the other case, or possible cases. If we have g to the d to the r equal to 1, right, for some positive r, we'd like to show that this force is r to be larger than k. All right? So look at this g to the dr is 1. But by the theorem I proved in class carefully, that means that dr is a multiple of n. Right? So dr is equal to nj. But then we have dr is nj, but remember n is what? n is 
n is kd, so I put that in here, what do I got? I've got, for some positive d, this equation. So we can cancel the d, right? And that gives us that r is equal to jk. But j and k are positive integers, right? So this tells you that r has to be greater than or equal to k, because j is greater than or equal to 1. Which then finishes the proof. Is it good? No, I don't know. If it's not, you read the book. But if you read the book, you're just going to hear the same thing again, because that's the book's proof. Um, but this, I think I can, I can add something here. Every subgroup of a cyclic group is cyclic. So, start, so we assume that the group is cyclic, all right? Take a subgroup. If the subgroup is just the identity subgroup, that's cyclic, right? Done. So it's, that's cyclic, great. So suppose it's not the identity subgroup. That means that there's some g, sorry, kind of forgetting the kind of punchline here, g not equal to uh, e, right? Oh, sorry, 1 my current notation. Um, and so, if you look at that, the cyclic subgroup generated by G, this thing, has to be a subset of H, right? Because, again, this is a subgroup, which means it's closed under powers and inverses of elements, which is what this is, right? And furthermore, this is, a, is an identity, right? So, G, um, uh, let's see here. Oh, let me make sure I'm careful not to get off the rails here. So at this point, we should notice that, yeah, you know, I was right, I was going to write that down. So g to, g to the k is equal to g to the minus k inverse, right? So <laughs> this implies that g to the k and g to the minus k are both in H, right? If k is negative, minus k is positive, if, right? If k is positive, k is positive. Anyway, the point is there are positive powers of g, right? There are positive powers of g. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have, I have failed. I'm supposed to say, this is important, g to the k. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sorry guys, that's supposed to be g to the k, I missed the k, oopsie. That's kind of important for the, <laughs> for the rest of the argument, okay? The point is, I mean, remember that the big group we're working in is powers of g, right? It's a cyclic group, so everything is a power of g. The point is, this could in principle be a positive or negative power, right? But because of this, and because the subgroups are closed under inverses, if it's got a negative power, it's automatically got the corresponding positive power. Okay, so what that means is we can look at what? We can look at <clears throat> the set X, I'll call it X, which will be G to the M in H, all right, such that M is greater than or equal to 1. So clearly such M um, are... Uh, bounded below by what? 1, right? And they're a subset of what? Natural numbers, right? So by the well-ordering principle, what? By well-ordering principle, there exists the smallest m. Smallest m. Do I have a notation for that? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm sorry, this is bad. Let me put an m bar here because I'm thinking of that as being a variable. I want to pick m as the smallest m bar, okay? So smallest m bar, call it m. All right, so that is 2 to the m. Oh, 2 to the m. I've been doing your homework, huh? <laughs> sorry that. Um, g, to, g to the m is an element of x, right? Which is, means it's what? x is a subset of? Oh, 
Oh yes, H, by construction, right? Notice that? So what's that mean? So the claim is that this M, whatever it is, is the generator of the subgroup. Okay, so the claim is Now, <laughs> note that g to the m, right, is what? Well, anyway, so let me, just, let me just ask you this. Is it clear to you that this is a subset? A subset, well, a subset of g is kind of like automatic, but more interestingly, it's a subset of what? H, right, since GM is an element of H, and so this cyclic subgroup is formed by powers and inverses of this element of H, which by closure and inverse, you know, closure under inverses, must be a subset of H. All right. The harder direction, of course, is that H is the other way around, right? So we, we'd like to show the other inclusion, which is that what? So the question is why, why is H a subset of the cyclic subgroup generated by GM, right? That's what we still face in the proof. So how should we do that? <clears throat> right. Um, so what we do is we look at, now G, GK is an H, right? So notice GK is an element of H, right? That was, that's assumed, it's that same K, right? And we can apply the um, division algorithm to write K, divide by M. So K is equal to QM plus R, where what? I can't spell. Where zero is less than or equal to R, less than what? M, right, because we're dividing by M. So then just calculate what is, what is G to the K, though? So G to the K is equal to G to the QM plus R, right? And what can we do with that? Let's solve for GR. GR is equal to what? It's equal to G to the K minus QM, which we could rewrite as what? G to the K times G to the M to the, yeah, to the minus Q, but so we could write G to the M inverse to the Q if you like. The point is that's in H and this is in H. Product of things in H, again, this is an element of H, right? So therefore G to the R is an element of H But it's, a, but it's what? It's an element of H where R is smaller than the smallest power, right? Which means it has to be zero. So by definition of little m being the smallest m bar, this implies that R is equal to zero. But what does it mean for R to be equal to zero? Yeah, it means G to the g to the k is equal to g to the g to the m to the q, yeah. Which means what? Yeah, g, g k is an element of that thing, right? But everything in H, um, but, but, uh, but I'm sorry, I'm still missing something here.
Sorry, my, my brain not working at the moment. But you guys see it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but so that's not that's actually not the same K, is it? I mean, it doesn't have. I, I was thinking. I'm sorry, guys. I was thinking that. I think I'm thinking of another proof. I don't think this K is fixed from up here. Like this is just a K. I mean, we could yeah. you could erase this K. Let's make it a kappa. It wouldn't change anything down here, right? So the point is that that's an arbitrary, that's an arbitrary element of H, and we've just showed that this arbitrary element of H is also in there, which shows that H is a subset of that, and then so we have double containment, which shows that they're equal. So any cyclic, any subgroup of cyclic group is cyclic. All right. <sighs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> One more proof and then I will shut up about proofs. <sighs> this one's easier. Let G equal to the cyclic sub be cyclic with generator G and the order of G, let's let it be N, then G is also generated by G to the K, if and only if the greatest common divisor of K and N is one. So this, this we use, we, we use this theorem so much. This is, this is one of those mission critical things to know. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see here. If G is equal to GK, right, then <clears throat> um, G is an element, I got G is an element of GK, how do I know this? An idiot. So if this is if this is equal to G, yeah. Well, G's in there, isn't it? Idiot. N not you guys, me. So um, what that means then, of course, is that uh, G to the G K to the M is equal to. This all made so much sense when I wrote it on this paper, but then I get up here. G K to the M equals to G for some M and Z, right? And um, thus, g to the mk is equal to g to the 1, right? Which gives me that g to the mk minus 1 equal to 1, right? Which by the theorem I proved carefully in class says what? mk minus 1 equals to what? Some multiple of the order of the group, right? Say nj. Well, there you have it. That means that mk plus, I'm um, sorry, I can't do math, mk minus nj is equal to 1, right? Don't be distracted by the minus. We can lump that into the, um, into the n. I mean, right, this is k times m plus minus j times n equals to 1, which remember that implies that the greatest common divisor of m, I've, I've mixed up the mean, <laughs> I can't, I can't win for losing here today. Um, I'm trying to make a point here. This is an integer linear combination of k and n, right, equal to 1, which means the greatest common divisor of m, I'll get it right eventually, k Good grief. K and N is equal to 1. I'm sorry, it's painful to watch me think today. I mean, it also, I mean, fun fact, 
This also means that the greatest common divisor of m and minus j is 1, or m and n is 1, or k and, I mean, there's a bunch of GCDs you could read off that stupid linear combination, but anyway. That's the relevant one. Conversely, and it's almost the same calculus. I mean, probably if certain students were here, they would tell me I can just reverse these arrows, but just humor me. Um, GCD of k comma n equals to 1 implies that kx plus ny equals to 1 for some x and y in the integers, right? Which means what? If you look at it, um, g to the g to the k um, g to the kx plus ny equals to g to the one, right? Which means that gk <coughs> to the x is equal to g. Because, I mean, I'm skipping a step, but this is g to the n, y, but g to the n is, is the identity. Right? I mean, this, fine. I see you guys looking for, for con slightly confused. Let me un undo that for you. AKA g to the k. But what does it mean if g to the k to the x power is, is equal to g? That means everything that is generated by g is also generated by g to the k because g to the k to the x gets back g. And since g generates the whole group, that implies that g to the k is, the, you know, generates the group. All right, I'm tired of proving things. I was, I'm still toying with the idea of proving the last, the, the fundamental theorem of uh, cyclic, finite cyclic groups. But tell you what, I think I'm going to do that Friday against my better judgment, and I'll just take your questions for what time remains today. I have to end at like six on the dot because um, apparently I have a fruit order to pick up at Big Lots, so I can't, I can't linger. I don't know, my wife buys fruit from some farmer, and for some reason they meet at the Big Lots. And I figure a half, I think a half hour, is that unreasonable? I can get from here to my car to Big Lots in a half hour, is that? What's that? Parking garage. Okay, okay. Okay, so if I don't get there in time, it's on you. So you guys have questions? <laughs> but of course. Ah, let me um, erase the evidence here. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the proofs in the cyclic group section, but if you actually look at the theorems that are given, they're pretty easy to understand and you should be able to remember them for the remainder of the course, I hope. We do use them. Problem 18. So what was your question? It's not exactly a question. <laughs> Yeah. That. No, these are self-contained. There should be enough information to do these without going and looking up. This is not, these problems do not intend for you to go look at the book and find new things. It's not like that. These, these, are, these, are, these are pretty much self-contained. I mean, you need to know the subgroup test. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's some linear algebra you'll have to do for C. But... What is ONR? I mean, it is literally what I say in part D of problem 18. Right, so we would take that from problem 18 to do problem 19. Because in problem 19, it just says Yes, it, it is understood that that is the same ONR as yeah, problem 18. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Now, the greater mystery is what's the C, sub C of G in problem 20. That actually is a totally reasonable question to ask about, but that's the last problem, so you guys haven't done it yet. 
Let's see, or so. I'm just I'm speculating. But <laughs> Z is. Uh, no, I the book. That oh, that one's in the book? Oh, okay. Fair enough. But this is the centralizer of G, right? Which is um, X and, and big G such that what? XG equals, XG equals to GX, right? To con and so to contrast, the center of G is what? We could say X and G such that what? XG equals to GX, but for all G in G, right? This is the difference. The centralizer is for a fixed G. The center is for all G. I would use a subgroup test on that one. For example, to see that the, see that the identities in the, um, well, I'm sorry, Do I, am I saying the right thing? So I keep saying that, but I don't think I mean that. I think you need to show that those sets are equal, right? So you should do double containment. I'm an idiot. Double containment. And it's not hard, is it? Like three lines, right? Yeah. I mean, you, if you'd like to get, I mean, I'm, I'm feeling magnanimous today. If you want to guess what J should be, I'm, I'm willing to take a guess and tell you if it's wrong. Yeah. It's not, I mean, I don't think there's any kind of derivation to do here at all. It's just pattern matching. The question is, how do you make our transpose JR equal to J become the condition R transpose R equal to I? What choice of J makes that happen? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, was that all of 19? No. No, you also had to prove that that was a... Phew, goodness gracious, I was worried. Well, that's the thing, is you should prove it for an arbitrary J. Right. Yeah. And then Yeah, that, that last sentence is kind of an add-on. I mean, so, the, the real, the, mo, mo, the, 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 the interesting part of this problem, I would say, in some sense, is to prove that GJ is a subgroup of GLNR. Yeah. Well, some fine print, J has to be invertible. <clears throat> I mean, it's easy, enough to, it's easy enough to see that the identity is in G sub J, right? Because I transpose times J times I, is that equal to J again? Yep. So the identity is in G sub J. I'll, let the rest, I'll leave you guys the rest of it, though. <laughs> it's not that bad. You can do it. Just remember, matrix multiplication does not commute. Mm. What you were saying, some Emily? Uh, yeah, I said for eighteen, it's a binary operation function. Yeah. 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 Eighteen. Which part are we talking about? Just like to do the subgroup test. Like. Yes, permutations are a subgroup with respect to the composition of of bijections. Okay. Remember, the permutations on Rn are the set of all bijections on Rn. So the a group operation is, is function composition, yeah. And the thing you have to check, right, is that if you take the composite, if you take, if you compose two isometries, right, then the distance between two points is still preserved by their composite if it's preserved by both of them. I, I don't, I, I should, anyway, but yeah, composition. Go for it.
Well, okay, so is the identity in there? Does the identity fix everything in X? Okay, so X, the identity is in there. Right. Pick two permutations that fix everything in X, right? Say sigma and tau. If we take sigma and tau and we feed it a point from X, what happens to that point in X? It stays fixed, right? So that proves that sigma tau is in that subgroup. So it's, it's closed. And we could stop there because it's a finite subgroup. It's a finite subset of a group. So I don't even have to check inverses. If you wanted to check inverse, the calculation goes like this. I get stuck on that sometimes. I think it was just figuring out what was going on. See, if, if sigma fixes k, then k of k is sigma k, but then sigma sigma inverse is the identity, and then, so that shows that the inverse to a k fixing thing is also k fixing, which shows that that, set, that subgroup is closed under inverses, yeah. But we, again, we don't, I mean, be lazier than me. When I wrote the solution, I just wrote it out and I did the inverse thing and then it, finally at the on, end of it, it dawned on me, wait a minute, I'm looking at a subset of SN. SN is n factorial in order, which is finite, so I could use the finite group test. I didn't need even check inverses. I'm, I'm being, not being optimally lazy when I did the solution to that one. But. <clears throat> I'm sorry, in, in what, I didn't hear. So we're trying to show that whatever is in brackets is a subset of SN, right? And the only thing that exists is in that is that one thing that exists in that? So it just fixes everything? Well, no, I mean, let's, let's that's look at a, like a let, let's look at like S, S5, for example. And let's look at X equal to, I don't know, one, two, three. So this H would be what? It would be sigma in S5 such that what? Yeah, sigma of k is equal to k again for what? k and x, right? k equal to 1, 2, 3 in this case, right? So in this particular example, what would h be? What would h be for this, this universe of permutations? Right. It can't move 1, 2, or 3. It means it, it can only move the things besides those, right? So I think this one would be if I'm understanding things right, the identity permutation, of course, yeah. and four or five. Is anything else in there? I don't. I think everything else would move one, two, or three. No, x x is a subset. S is, X is just a finite subset of, it's a subset of, in this case, one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't have to be the whole set. If it's the whole set, then yeah, I agree with you. If it's the whole set, this is not an interesting, no, we do not. You're right. If it is the whole set, then it's saying it fixes everything in the set, which means it's the identity. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that is what you should think under that misreading of the problem. Yeah, that, that's good. It's bad, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Other other questions? I think I have If there are no other questions, I'll finish the proofs. Other questions? Yeah, take off. It's you should tag someone. <laughs> that is true. I'm gonna I'm gonna live dangerously and stay here like three more minutes. Do you guys have any any questions? Like a way or 
So one of the things we have, of course, is this theorem. I mean, this actually is an answer to your question, um, not just me misbehaving. If G is cyclic, that means that it's generated by a single element, right? And then we said one, basically if H is a subgroup of G, then H is equal to G to the D, which is generated by G to the D for some, for some divisor, for some D which divides N, right? And this means that the order of H has to divide the order of G. This turns out not to, this, this thing I put in parentheses here, this is not helpful. It's in fact a general truth of group theory for a finite group that the order of subgroups has to divide the order of the group. This is called Lagrange's theorem. And we, we found it, we'll, we'll learn this after test one because I don't cover 2.6 until after test one, which is where that theorem is. So this is just special to cyclic groups at the moment, but this is in fact a general truth. This doesn't reveal anything. Um, the fact that <clears throat> the, every subgroup has to be cyclic, well, that's, that's telling. If you, had a sub, if you had a group which had a subgroup which wasn't cyclic, it can't hope to be cyclic. There's that. Um, th but two is actually a little bit more insight, is a little bit more insightful, which is that if k, if k is a divisor of n, if k divides n, then g to the n over k is the unique subgroup <coughs> of order k. That's actually somewhat telling. Um, So it turns out this D has to, it, it, we will, I'll try to look at the proof at the start of next class. I'm just going to have to, it's, I face, face the music. But this D in the proof, my D became a G, what's wrong with me? So D in the proof actually is the greatest common divisor of, um, um, hmm. M and N. What's M? I'm sorry, what's N? <sighs> oh. Oh, fine. It's not, as, it's not as helpful as I thought it was. That M, it's coming from the proof of the theorem we did earlier, which said that if it's a subgroup of a cyclic group, what? It is cyclic, right? which means it has to be g to the m for some m. So you, you play games with this m and that n. If you pick the GCD of that, you can prove that it's generated by g to the power d as well. Um, I don't know how that, but, but, hold on a second. I've already proved this subgroup. Why do I have to prove this again? We already proved that a subgroup of a cyclic group was cyclic. Why am I proving that again here? Anyway, next class. There's obviously something I'm misconstruing in this proof here. Um, to answer your question, you, just, you have to find an element which generates the whole group. Um, and there are things that are evidence that that won't happen. Like I said, if it's, if it's not abelian, it can't be cyclic. Um, if it has, but this is, this is the more interesting part right here. If it has more than one subgroup of a particular order, so like when we look at Z8 star, it's, you know, this is 1, 3, 5, 7. The fact that 3 squared is equal to 1 and 5 squared equals to 1, that alone is damning. Because this says that there are two, I mean, is 3 in the sub, you know, 5 is not an element of this, right? And 3 is not an element of that, right? Here you go, these are two subgroups of order two, which are not the same. Therefore, the group of units for Z mod eight is not cyclic. Now we, we proved that it wasn't cyclic by just exhaustively looking at the powers of every element and showing that none of them got the whole thing. But that's evidence enough given part two of the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups. So that's, so for that, 
you're asking about the Cartesian product one in a responsible and nice way, and I appreciate that. What you want to do is you want to produce a generator. So the way to think about that is why don't you think about other things that cut your teeth on an example. So Z3 cross Z5, how about that? The orders are relatively prime as we want, right? Wasn't that what's needed? Yes. So or relatively prime orders. And you can look at this and you'll be able to prove you know, that this is cyclic. What's this, what, what does it take to generate that? What's a generator for that? Here, I'll give you a weird one. Two, um, and uh, two, three will generate it. <laughs> Let me be less weird. I mean, you could, you could check this is going to be a generator for it. Are we additive here? Yeah. Okay. And you, you can even look at this example. Um, and you can see what fails there that might give you a better sense of what you're doing. But if you, you've got two groups, right? They're both cyclic. You're trying to show that the Cartesian product is cyclic. The proof can involve nothing more than what? The fact that you've got a generator for G, and you've got a generator, I'm sorry, was it MN or was it G and H? I? So you've got a generator for G, you've got a generator for H. Somehow you need to use both of those generators, right, to create a generator for G, G cross H. You can do that. You can prove that something if I say much more, I'm going to almost tell you the proof, but it's no accident that one is a generator for Z3 and one is a generator for Z5, and you know what, two is a generator for Z3, and three is a generator for Z5 too. But um, in fact, this is very boring. I mean, anything except for zeros is generators for these because they're prime, but I should have done like Z25 versus Z8 or something that was more exciting, but oh well. <clears throat> All right. I think I'm going to be late for my fruit now. Oh, no. Yeah. Thanks, Devin.